Hi, my name is Miguel Quiles. I'm a Sony artisan of imagery. I'm a professional portrait, headshot, and wedding photographer based out of New Jersey. And I've been shooting portraits for almost 15 years. And I'm just fascinated by all of the different faces that are out there. And I've kind of made it my lifelong mission and quest to find interesting faces and to photograph them. In this video, you'll learn about how to create a hero shot, setting up your camera, lenses, lights, and studio space, tethering your camera, working with subjects to pose them and directing hand placement, using a variety of cameras, lenses, and lights to achieve different looks. Today I'm going to pull back the curtain on a professional studio portrait shoot. I'm going to show you how I use a variety of Sony camera bodies and lenses and how I use different techniques to get me to what I call my hero shot. And once that's all done, I want you to be able to take all of these techniques, all of these different tips that I'm going to show you so that you can get your own hero shot. We all see images in our day-to-day -day life all day, every day on social media websites and magazines. There's always that one shot that we kind of come across and we stop and we stare and we look at it and we evaluate it and we just kind of take it in. And it could be an interesting, beautiful image. It could be a mysterious image. It could be something very dramatic. But my goal with my hero shots is to create what I call a scroll stopper type of image. It's one of those where on social media you'd be scroll, scroll, scroll amongst all of the millions of images that we see on social media and all of a sudden you hit that one shot where it's like, oh my goodness, this is amazing or this is beautiful or this is weird or whatever. The goal is to create that one hero shot that literally will stop the viewer in their tracks and force that viewer to really just stare and to contemplate whether they like the image or not. Gear selection is a really important thing that we are considering when we're doing this studio portrait shoot. And I have four different setups that I'm going to be using, four different variations and combinations of camera bodies and lenses that ultimately are trying to get that hero shot with each combination. So the very first setup is going to be the Sony a7R II, and I'm going to pair that with the brand new 85 millimeter 1.4 G Master lens. That is my go-to setup whenever I'm shooting a face. It's a fantastic lens for shooting close-ups. It's a great lens if you're trying to shoot maybe a half body or three quarter length, or you could even do full body shots with an 85 1.4 that just gives you fantastic results. So I usually start off with the 8514 and we're going to take kind of a wider shot with that with the goal again being capturing that one hero image. I'm going to shoot a lot of images, but at the end of the day, I'm trying to get that one shot. So that's the very first setup. The second, I'm going to keep the same camera body with the A7R2 and I'm going to pair it with the brand new Sony 70 to 300 millimeter lens. And the reason why I'm choosing this particular lens is that I want to be able to actually cut in and crop in a little bit closer on the model's face. I don't want the viewer to have to see the background and see collarbones and see all of this additional information. What I want the viewer to do is to really concentrate on the expression, on the face, on the hands. I want them to really be up close and personal with the model and with the subject. So. We're going to shoot that very, very tight with a 70 to 300. And again, we're trying to go for that one hero image. We're going to go ahead and switch up after that and go to the A7R2 with the 90 millimeter 2.8 macro. And this is a lens that is not your typical portrait lens, but it has a lot of advantages. One of the big advantages when you're using a macro to shoot portraits is actually twofold. It's extremely sharp. So you're going to capture a lot of detail. You're going to see a lot more information with the macro that you may not see with the 85 millimeter or with a different lens. So it's extremely sharp. And the other thing is the minimum focus distance is going to allow me to be able to shoot the wider shots, but then also get in really, really close and start to capture a lot of detail in the model's face. And then for my final look, I'm going to shoot with the Sony A6300 and I'm going to pair that up with their new 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. 
And the reason why I'm doing that is that I wanna show that you can actually take this smaller, more compact camera body with a much more affordable lens, and you can still get great portraits using a very inexpensive and very simple to use setup. We're actually gonna strip back the modifier as well. We're gonna go from kind of a big, large light source to something a little bit smaller and lighter and more portable and more affordable. And we're gonna shoot some really close up portraits using that combination. And so what I want to be able to do is, again, to get that hero shot using that setup and then just show you the whole range of what you're able to get, depending on what look you're going for. You can see the results with an 85, a 70 to 300, a 90 macro, and then of course a 50 millimeter on a crop sensor body. Camera settings are a very, very important part of a studio shoot. And I like to keep things really simple. And my goal with these camera settings is to give you kind of a jumping off point so that you can dial these settings in in your own studio environment and hopefully land on a look that looks very, very similar to what I'm gonna show you in this video. So first things first, what you need to make sure that you're doing, anytime you're shooting with an off-camera flash, you need to go into your menu and make sure that you turn off the live view setting in your menu, make sure that that is set to off. The reason being is that if you're shooting at an F8, F9, F11, I think we shoot as high as F13, when you start to focus, you're gonna notice that your screen will black out if your live view display is turned on. So make sure that you turn that off because it will make the whole shoot run so much smoother. Next, we're going to go ahead and start off at F8, 1 1 60th of a second, ISO 100. And this is kind of a nice starting point for your camera settings and I'll kind of tell you how I tweak it from there, but that's where I start off. In these images, I'm trying to go for kind of a, a gray, soft gray backdrop. And again, I want the light to be very bright and very flat on the model's face. With a light set up like this, you have three different factors that you have to uh, understand how it works. So you have the distance of this light source to your model, you have the distance of the model to the background, and then you have the overall, the light to the background. When you're doing a one light setup, this is something that you can kind of play around and you can get different shades and tones of backdrops depending on how close you bring that light to the background. I'm paying particular attention to how far that light is from her. I'm paying attention to how far she is from the backdrop so that I can get the perfect ratio with that one light to get the backdrop lit perfectly and get the model lit perfectly. But throughout this entire process, all of the settings on my camera are pretty much gonna be exactly the same. My lighting is gonna be set up at a quarter power. And the reason why I set my studio strobe up to a quarter power is I want the light to be able to recycle quickly. So if I have it at half power or if I'm shooting it at full power, there's gonna be several seconds of delay in between shots. And I don't want that. It's gonna break up the flow of the, the, the shoot. The model is gonna be sitting and waiting in between each shot. At a quarter power, the flash just will go off, go off, go off. And it gives the model the opportunity to really get into a flow of just giving different looks and different poses. So quarter power on the light. Now, when I start off, I have the lights at a quarter power, I have my camera at those settings that I just described, and I take that first shot. And from there, I'm looking at it and I'll evaluate the photo and I say, okay, if it's too bright, for example, I have two options. I could either go ahead and walk over to my light and I could dial down the power from a quarter power to maybe one eighth power and then take the shot again. Or what I tend to do on a shoot is rather than going back and forth with the light, I actually will dial up or down my aperture on my camera. So if I took that first shot at F8 and I saw that it was too bright, then what I would end up doing is go to F9, go to F11, go to F13. And as you continue to, to bring your aperture number up higher, you're gonna notice that the image actually gets darker and darker and darker until you land on your desired exposure. I would much rather do that than to have to keep walking back and forth and adjusting the light. When I shoot this style of portrait, I have a lot of different options to where I place my light. And you're gonna notice that for the first few series uh, segments of images, I'm gonna shoot them all the same. I'm gonna have my softbox very directional, very 
direct to the model. It's not going to be off to the side or something like that. It's going to be directly in front of the model, slightly above her. And part of the reason why I set my light up in that way is that I want to have a really nice flat light on her face. I don't want to have very harsh shadows because the shadows are a little bit distracting. For beauty close-up images, the flat lighting for me personally just looks fantastic. And so that's going to be the very first three segments of images that I'm going to shoot are going to be with that softbox, very directional, going straight ahead. Then what we're going to do when we switch over to that A6300 setup with the 50 mil lens, I'm actually going to take that modifier off and I'm going to put an umbrella. And so part of the reason why I'm using the umbrella is that I want to be able to show you that you can get a very easily, readily available modifier and still get really great portraits. For that one, we're going to change things up a little tiny bit. Instead of having the modifier directly in front of the model, we're actually going to put it to my right side. And so the reason why I'm doing that is now I do want to introduce a little bit of shadows onto her face to really carve out the detail and kind of give that curvature that you really don't get unless you have some shadows. But I still want to have soft shadows. I don't want to have these the very harsh, defined transitions from light to shadow. So using the silver umbrella and kind of placing it off to the side gives me a nice balance between kind of a hard light and a, and a soft light type of a look. So those are going to be the two main setups that we're going to use as far as the lighting goes for these particular shots. When you're setting up your lighting in your studio, there's kind of a process that I follow every single time. And it's a little counterintuitive to a lot of people, but follow along with me here for a moment. What I like to do is if you're shooting in a studio environment or maybe you're shooting on location, there's going to be light pouring in from everywhere. In the studio that I'm in right now, I have lights to the side, lights above, lights behind. And these are lights that I can't really control. I mean, I can't control them to some extent, but I can't really control them that much. So what I'm looking to do before I take any shots, I'm looking to actually negate all of the ambient light. So all of this natural light that's in the room and even artificial light that's in the room, I'm trying to negate it. I'm trying to make it to where it does not impact my photograph whatsoever. People ask me all the time, why do you start at F8? That's the reason why I started F8. Because naturally, in many studio environments, in most scenarios, if you set your camera up to F8, 1 1 60th of a second, ISO 100, your intended goal image should be completely dark. You should have, when you take a shot, before you turn on your studio strobes, you should have a completely black image on the back of your screen. Once you have that launching off point, then you could put your studio triggers on, you could turn your lights on, and you're going to notice that now you have complete control over your lighting. Now you can move it to where exactly where you want it to be. You can shape it the way you want. And you don't have to worry about the overhead lights or the side lights or a television that might be on in the background that's adding additional light into the environment. If you take that first shot and you notice at F8 that you still see ambient light that is bleeding into your image, then that's when you go up to F9, F11, F13. Now, there's a little bit of a balance, though, that you have to look out for because as you go up in your aperture, it's kind of knocking down the power of your strobe a little tiny bit. So that quarter power, all of a sudden now, you may have to bump up your power settings in order to keep up with the aperture that basically negates all of the light in the room. So this is kind of the dance that you have to play into to be able to get to the point to where you have an image where you can perfectly set up your lights, you can perfectly control them, and you can get that final look without having to worry about all of the different light that's spilling into your image. Setting up your studio space can be very, very simple. What I like to do first is to get my lights set up, get my modifiers set up, kind of have a general idea of where I want that to be. I love to shoot tethered for my studio shots, so I will bring in my tether table with my laptop, I will have that set off a little bit to the side to where the model can't necessarily see it directly. And part of the reason that I do that is in between shots, I don't want the model to be distracted by, you know, the camera that keeps changing the images as they're being fed from the camera. So, but I want to be able to see it. I want to be able to evaluate and determine whether or not the images are in focus, whether or not the lighting is great. 
So I'll have that set off to the side to where it's not in the way. And then from there, I basically have my camera. I'll begin to put that together, put my triggers together. I always like to take test shots ahead of the model actually showing up and, and standing in the spot to make sure that everything is working good. And I tell this to a lot of starting photographers because a lot of the times photographers think everything is gonna work out great and they don't test anything, the model stands there, and all of a sudden things don't work. And you're kind of setting yourself up for a little bit of failure or at least a little bit more of an uphill climb. You could imagine, for example, if you were a patient and you didn't feel well and you go to the doctor's office and the doctor walks in and they're fumbling, they drop the folder, they uh, drop their stethoscope, you're gonna have less confidence that this person knows what they're doing. And it's the same thing as a photographer. If you walk into your studio space and you are fumbling with your lights, you're fumbling with where your stuff is, it doesn't look professional. And so the subjects will look and say, oh my gosh, this is just a crazy sideshow. You wanna make sure that they're comfortable. You wanna make sure that they're confident in your abilities as a photographer. And part of being able to get to that is making sure that you set up everything ahead of time. If you have a friend that can stand in and allow you to test your lighting, that would be ideal because then that way you can see what the lighting is gonna look like. You can tweak your lights, change your settings if you need to, and then go ahead and they can leave and the model walks into the set and everything is ready to go. And all of this really is going to help you a lot to instill the confidence in them that you know what you're doing, that you are in command of your equipment, you're in command of your lighting, and they can focus on giving you great expressions and not have this in the back of their mind that you have no idea what you're doing. So try that out, give it a shot. Next time you shoot, test all of these things, set these things up ahead of time, and you'll notice that you're gonna get way better results. Tethering is an ultra important part of any studio shoot. And part of the reason is that it's really important for you to be able to take a look at your images as you're shooting them, to see them on a bigger screen, on a bigger monitor, to be able to determine if you have the images in focus, to make sure that the lighting is not too bright or too dark. You can actually take your images from your computer and bring them into Photoshop and start tweaking them and processing them kind of ahead of time to see if this is going to be the way that you want the final images to look. So there's a lot of advantages there. If you have a team of people, let's say you have a hairstylist, a makeup artist, maybe you're shooting for a client, it's nice to not have them hovering over you and trying to see the back of your camera. So being able to take your tethered setup and have it away from your shooting setup also gives you a lot of flexibility. Now, for me, I tend to shoot almost 99.9% .9 of the time tethered into Capture One. Capture One is a fantastic program that pairs very, very nicely with Sony cameras. And one of the things that I really love about it, it actually has a live feed that shows up on the computer that looks exactly like what I'm seeing through the viewfinder on my camera. So it's pretty awesome if maybe I'm working with a creative team and they say they want it to be framed a certain way, rather than them seeing the shot after I've already taken it, I can actually move the camera around and they see the live view, the live feed from my camera onto the laptop and they could tell me, yeah, Miguel, that's exactly how I want it to be framed and I could start taking those shots. So it's very, very powerful, very intuitive program. You can actually change your settings as well. So let's say if you have somebody that is watching and managing these images from the laptop and let's say it's too bright, they can actually go from their software on Capture One and lower the exposure so that each photo that you're taking is being fed into the computer with those adjustments being applied to it. When I first started with tethering, the reason why I loved it was that I could immediately tell if I move my light to the right or to the left, I can see what that image is gonna look like. If I bring it above, I can see what that image looks like. It helps to look at it on a big monitor. In this case, on my laptop, I have a 13 inch screen, much bigger than the two inch or three inch screen that you have on the back of your camera. Shooting tethered also gives me the ability to be able to show my model what's working, what's not working, how can we improve our posing? How can we improve our expressions? And I could actually show her the pictures on a big monitor to where she can look at it and say, okay, I, I really like what I'm doing with this, or maybe you need to adjust your hand in this certain way. 
You'll notice as well that if I see things like stray hairs, I can point it out to the hair and makeup stylist to say, hey, clean up the makeup a little bit here, or maybe there's some stray hairs over here that we need to pat down. It's much easier for me to show them on a laptop screen than it is for me to show them the back of my camera. That's one of the really big advantages to me shooting tethered is that they can actually see all of this on a big screen and not have to handle my actual camera. When you're working with models, it is really important that you have a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm that you communicate. Communication is very, very important between whether they're models or just anybody on the street. People need to hear how they're doing. You need to reinforce and encourage and give them a joy and enthusiasm for this process. And that all comes from you as the photographer basically telling them that you're doing a great job. Wow, that's wonderful. Oh, that's so awesome. And you're saying this as a photographer to really kind of amp them up and let them know that they're doing good. I've seen a lot of photo shoots where people don't talk. And so the person is just standing there and you're taking their picture. They have no idea if they're doing a great job, if they're doing a poor job. Usually if they don't hear something, they're thinking they're doing terrible. So it's really important for you as the photographer to really inject that encouragement and that enthusiasm to tell them they're doing a good job. Even though it might be that they are still warming up and they're still, they're not giving it to you just yet, but they're gonna give it to you faster if you are encouraging them and telling them that they're doing a great job. So that's probably the most important thing when you're working with anyone, whether they're models or subjects, is to really encourage them and communicate with them throughout the entire process. When it comes to posing your models and posing your subjects, hands are something that is very challenging. It took me several years first to figure out what does good hand placement look like? What does a good hand engagement in a photograph look like? So that's something that you have to train your eye to see how do hands look and work in an image. Hands in this case are very, very important. Being that we're gonna be shooting very close up shots and kind of chest up length portraits, the hands are gonna play a crucial role in adding interest and depth and character to a lot of these portraits. So usually what I'll end up doing is I'll take a few shots and I'll review and I'll try to evaluate a couple of things. I'm evaluating the expressions, I'm evaluating the lighting, and I'm also evaluating the hands. And what are the hands doing in the image? Are they adding to the allure? Are they adding to the mystery, to the sensuality, to the beauty? All of these different feelings and moods and expressions can be demonstrated by how you change the position of your hands. So looking through a few shots like this, like I love this. This particular shot is one where she has the hands perfectly. To me, good hand placement is natural. It's something where you look at the image and the hands just fall naturally in a spot that it almost looks like they were brushing their hair out of their face and you happen to catch them at the right moment. You actually see that it's not like that. They're just setting their hand and then you're taking the shot. So it's you're trying to capture this natural state in a very unnatural setting and environment. So it's a skill that you have to work through as a photographer to look at it and evaluate what looks good and what doesn't look good. For me, this type of a shot is awesome. It's very soft. The hands are nice and soft. I tend to look out for shots that look like the hands were very posed and just placed on the face. I don't like, for example, when the hands are pressing against the skin or pressing or hooking um, to where it's very harsh because it looks posed. And the thing with hands, again, is it needs to look 100% natural. It needs to look like you just happen to catch them at that right moment where it just looked super, super natural. And Abby does a really good job. She makes my job easy here. Just looking through some of these shots, she gives a lot of variation as to where she places her hands. The other thing as well with a lot of these shots is what they show the camera. So for example, I will always instruct the model, I wanna see the blade of their hand. What I don't wanna see is the inside or the back side of the hand. The inside of the hand is not really a beautiful thing to look at. Um, it's very distracting. You'll have people that have beautiful faces and then all of a sudden you put the inside of the hand to the face and you see wrinkles, everybody's hands are wrinkled. You look at a little baby's hands, they have a bunch of wrinkles and lines. That doesn't make a good juxtaposition 
up against somebody's beautiful skin when they have lines and stuff on their hand. The other thing is if you show the back side of the hand, you also have veins, you have vascularity that shows up on the back side of their hand. But even worse is that if you're shooting really close, the size of their hand looks bigger to the camera when it's facing directly to it. So for example, as you can see here, if you see my face, my hand actually looks to be really huge compared to the size of my face. So if I shot a portrait that was from my wrist up to the top of my head, my hand would look huge. I'd look like I have Hulk hands or something because of how big it looks. But if I turn it to the side, now all of a sudden my head looks bigger than my hands. And for women in these types of a portrait, that's what you want to see. In this case, she does a really good job at showing that blade of the hand in each of these frames. You have to give them some sort of instruction as to what to do with their hands. So usually I know what looks good, so I'll tell them to mimic me and I'll tell them, bring your hands like this, bring it like this. I'm telling them to give me different expressions, I'm telling them to play characters and trying to get them outside of their own comfort zone to give me the exact expressions that hopefully will end up leading me to that hero shot that I'm trying to go for. So hands are a tough one, but it's something that you have to keep working on. And eventually you get to the point to where you know exactly what you need and you can communicate with the model what you need and they'll give it to you. An easy way that I have found to get your subjects to give you the types of expressions that you're looking to capture is to tell them to play a character. And it's very funny because people think that you have to be an actor or you have to be an actress to act these things out. And you don't, you simply don't. I've done it with children where I've told them, you've seen cartoon characters. I want you to play this particular cartoon character. And as you're that character, I want you to pretend like you're standing at the playground and there's somebody that is on your swing and it really makes you angry. And so I want you to look off in that direction because the swing is over there. And I want you to go like this and just, you're looking at them like, oh, I wish you would get off that swing. And so I'm giving them this story and they're like, okay, okay, that sounds fun. And they'll give you their interpretation of what you just described to them. And oftentimes, their interpretation is way better than what I just described to you. What I just told you looked really silly, but when you actually see somebody else doing it, you're gonna notice that you start getting their interpretation of it and the, the posing, the expressions, everything just looks more natural because you're giving them a natural scenario that they can basically play into. I really like what you're doing with the hands here. I wanna do some more like this. And I also want to do some more expressions because you have a very, I don't know how to put this, but you have like a kind of like an intensity. You kind of have like a strong, like you, you're a little wicked. <laughs> oh I like that. So I wanna get some more of that with these types of looks. So doing the same things with the hands, mm -hmm. but more sinister, okay. but sinister beauty. Playing a character is something that for me, in every photo shoot, it doesn't matter whether they're a professional model or just a subject that has never been in front of a camera, I always try to explain to them, this is the character that I see you as in these photos, and I want you to play to that. Even if you don't know exactly what that looks like, just play pretend. And you will be so surprised how awesome your portraits will look when people buy into that whole system. When it comes to shooting portraits, the eyes are everything. Everything in the image in terms of the posture, the posing, everything I want it all to funnel back into bringing attention to the subject's eyes. So everything that I'm doing in terms of the posing, in terms of the hand gestures, in terms of the direction that the model is looking, I'm trying to basically get the viewer to look directly into this person's eyes and to assess that person's mood, assess what they're thinking, where, where is their mind? What, you don't want to have that blank out to lunch type of expression. So when you give somebody this story and you tell them this is the story that you're kind of playing out and you're looking off in this direction and you're seeing these things, they think these things in their mind and then they start to emote that. Through using different techniques like shooting with a longer lens, shooting in really, really tight and close, it really brings the person into that image to say, I wonder what they're looking at. I wonder what they're thinking. And you can have 10 different people that will look at that one shot, 
and everybody builds their own story and scenario around that shot to say, well, I think that they were looking at this, or they were thinking this, or they were thinking that. And those are the things that really have that scroll stop ability that I try to go for when I'm shooting these types of portraits. I want you to stop and think and say, this is the story, and then, no, 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 this is the story. And that's the way to be able to do that is to really focus on the eyes, focus on the expressions, and kind of sell this story and sell this mood and sell this feel in that final hero shot. When you're posing your subjects, I have come up with a simple process to be able to pose the subject without actually having to physically touch them. And it's something that really, number one, makes the subject much, much more comfortable. Number two, it makes the flow of the shoot go so much faster. Rather than having to stop and position and move the model, and they start to feel uncomfortable because they feel like their natural movements are not pleasing to the camera, you can actually pose a model without actually physically touching them. And I'm gonna show you how easy this is. The first thing that I do is I tell the model this story. I tell them the very first thing I want you to do, and I'll tell you as my model, you guys can follow along at home and pretend like I am posing you as my subject. I will tell you, I want you to pretend like you are looking in the mirror. And so if you were looking into the mirror and I tell you, I want you to mirror me and I want you to do this, right? Are you guys doing that at home? All right, you're mirroring me, great. I want you to go like this, right? I want you to go like that. I want you to go like this. I want you to go like that. And so I could tell you very easily, I could say, I want you to go this way. I want you to bring the shoulder up. I want you to bring it back, bring the hand up. If you mirror me, I can get you to do any type of pose just by telling you, you're looking in the mirror, I'm your reflection, mirror me. So that's the first thing. That's how I can get them to look one way, look the other, tell them to put their hands by their side, go like this. I could do all sorts of different positions just by telling them to mirror me. The second thing that I do is what I call my Jedi Claw. And so if I put my hand up like this, I want you to pretend like I am palming your face like a basketball. So I have my hand, so it's like this, palming your face, and I tell you go like this or go like this. And what I'm doing is it's gonna tilt the head this way or tilt the head that way. And very quickly and easily, I could tell you, okay, we're gonna put the two together. I want you to mirror me, go like this, perfect. I want you to tilt the head this way, perfect. So there's the second step. We have the Jedi Claw, first step is mirror. The next thing that I do is what I call the old Bill Clinton. If I put my thumb like this, or put my hand like this, I want you to pretend like I am holding just your chin. And when I do this, and I tilt, go this way, right? So I'm gonna go that way, or this way, or down, or up. Then the harder movement, and I always have to explain this to them, I'll turn sideways so you can see it. If I tell the model, if I bring my thumb closer to my face, what I want them to do is to do this. I want them to basically turtle. And what that's going to do is, and I'll show the camera here directly, if I'm looking at the camera, this is natural for me, this is comfortable, this probably gives me a kind of a chunky chin right now. But if I go like this, all of a sudden the skin gets kind of tight, now all of a sudden I have a more defined jawline, I look slimmer, and so there will be certain times when I want them to look a little bit thinner and I just pull their chin forward towards me, bring it down, over, right, up or down. So the old Bill Clinton, we have the claw, the Jedi claw, we have the mirroring. The last part is if I put both of my hands up like this, I want you to pretend like I am holding your, or I'm touching your shoulders. So if I push this way, what I want you to do is to rotate this way or rotate this way. So we push that way, we push this way. And that way, if I get them into a pose, putting it all together, I tell them, mirror me, go like that, perfect. I want you to go ahead and tilt the head this way, perfect. Bring the chin this way, great. And then I'm gonna push the shoulder back, so we'll push it this way, boom. And I go ahead and I start taking my shots from there. Very quick, very easy way, and the other thing is, you could do this with groups of people. You could have two or three people, and you could say, okay, person number one, go like this, boom, perfect. Go to the next person, boom, boom, boom. Go ahead and pose them, come back, start taking your shots. You can even do this at a distance. I've done this on location in photo shoots where I'm trying to take a shot that encompasses the whole environment, and they could be standing 10, 15, 20 feet away, and I tell them to mirror me, 
and I could get them to pose exactly the way that I want them to pose within that environment. So use this as a way to be able to quickly pose your models and to get that perfect pose without having to really fidget and fight with it too much. Uh, let's see, so your hair is on that side. So I want you to mirror this way. It's perfect. Throughout that entire process, you have to make sure that you are letting that model know you're doing a great job, fantastic. That's exactly what I wanted. I want you to turn the head this way, perfect. And bring that shoulder. You have yeah, to communicate like with them. You can't just assume that they know that they're doing a really good job throughout that process. So as I'm telling them to pose and to mirror me and doing the Jedi claw thing, perfect, that looks great. Then go ahead and turn this way, fantastic. You have to let them know that they're doing a good job because again, that's gonna help you to get to that hero shot much, much faster. If you haven't tried this before, give it a try. You're gonna notice that you're gonna get better shots, better portraits much faster by encouraging them throughout this entire posing process. So we have our equipment set up here and we have our lights to where we think that we are ultimately gonna want everything to be. But we bring the model into this particular shooting scenario and I always like to start off with taking some test shots. And I'll tell the model right out of the gates, I don't want you to give me your best expressions just yet. Just kind of stand there for a second, look into the camera, let me take a couple of snaps, and from there I'm gonna evaluate whether I need to move the light up or down, move them closer to the background, move them closer to me. I'll make any of those adjustments and determinations without them actually seriously trying to model and pose and give me different expressions. I want them to save that for once I have everything perfect, then they can go ahead and start to actually give me that. So a lot of the getting to that point happens ahead of time before they've even stepped in. It's making sure that your lighting is in the right spot, making sure that your camera and settings are correct, making sure you tested your flash to make sure that it's going off. Uh, funny enough, making sure your lens cap is off so that you don't start taking those first test shots and they're like, uh, your lens cap is still on the camera. Make sure you've done all of that, you've set all of that stuff up, and then you go ahead and start testing your lights. And then once you see everything is perfect, great. Go ahead and just start taking your shots from there. First, I'm going to go ahead and start off shooting these shots with the A7R2 with the 85mm 1.4 G Master lens. One of the things that I love about the 85mm 1.4 G Master lens is its versatility. It is really a lens that is made to photograph people. It is a portrait lens through and through. And the reason why I say that it's a portrait lens is that it gives you this beautiful compression. If you shoot a portrait with a wider lens, something like a 35 or a 25, you're gonna notice that the person is gonna look much wider and much bigger than they actually look in real life. As to where the 85 millimeter lens gives you this beautiful compression to where the head and the face looks as it would if you saw somebody in person. It actually is not distorted and it's not stretched out. So the 85-1.4 has beautiful compression when you're shooting portraits. First few shots, we're gonna kinda ease into it, do your different expressions, different looks, and uh, we'll see how these lights play off. So. There's also an added element to it, which is that it's very, very sharp, very, very detailed. Excellent. If you're shooting it, let's say in the studio environment where I'm shooting it, that comes in handy to have that sharpness and that detail. That's one of the big reasons why I love using the 8514. It's just that sharpness and that versatility that I could shoot at a high aperture and it could be sharp and then also shoot wide open and still be sharp with beautiful, beautiful bokeh. As you're working with your subject, very one nice. thing that I like to do very often is I'll take a series of there shots. Maybe I'll do five or 10 or 15 shots. Excellent. And then I'll stop and I'll go back to my computer since we're shooting tethered and I'll evaluate those photos. And I'm doing that for a couple of different reasons. For one, I wanna make sure that nothing messed up, that my lights didn't get bumped or that I didn't bump my settings and all of a sudden it's looking different. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that it also gives the model a chance to basically have a little bit of a break. When you're shooting portraits, it's very mentally exhausting at times for the model to give you different expressions and different hand looks and gestures. And so doing your shots in fives and tens and fifteens and twenties, come up with whatever number feels best for your particular photo shoot. But that gives them the opportunity to kind of have a little bit of a mental breather 
then you bring them back into the space and you start shooting again. And you're gonna notice that you're gonna have fresher expressions throughout the course of the shoot if you're not shooting for an hour straight, like bing, 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 take that shot. And eventually they just get very tired and they start thinking, I don't know what else to do with my hands. So let them have that moment to recharge. Shoot in fives, tens, fifteens, and twenties. After you've taken a series of images, the next most important part is to really sit down and review your images. And I often will sit there and will go through all of the images very briefly and very quickly. So I'll just kind of scan through the images. I'll give them just a second or less a piece as I'm scrolling through these images. And what I'm trying to do is to try to find that one hero shot. And that one hero shot typically will jump out at me. As I'm scrolling through these images very quickly, I'll start to see this one shot that all of a sudden I say, hold the press, oh my gosh, I need to stop and evaluate this photo. And chances are that's probably gonna be one of the candidates to be my hero image that I go ahead and I deliver and I process at the end of this particular photo shoot. So as I'm going through these images, I'm also showing the model as well and I'm showing the hairstylist and the makeup artist and kind of giving them a little bit of an opportunity to see this is what we've been shooting and get them hyped up for the whole process and get them seeing these images to where they start to get excited and say, wow, I really like how this is turning out. And if they're having a good time, if everybody feels good about the creation process, then it's going to lead to better and better shots as the photo shoot continues to roll on. So let's say if you're reviewing these shots and you haven't really found your hero shot just yet, maybe you found one shot that looks kind of close, like it's almost there, it's like 65, 70% of the way there, but maybe they were looking too far off to the side or maybe their eyes weren't looking in the right direction. What I tend to do is I will bring the model over, we'll be looking at the images, and I always start off on a positive note. I'll say, I really love how you were doing A, B, C, and D in this particular shot. What I wanna try now is I want you to do the same type of thing, but I want you to look a little bit more to the camera and maybe tilt your head this way or maybe bring your hands in up here or maybe soften the hands or spread out the fingers or any of the multitude of different things that you could do to kind of tweak an image in a way that it looks better and more pleasing. So that's what I'll end up doing is to basically tell them that this looks pretty good. I like where this is going. I love all of these things about this shot. Let's try the same thing and do this. And you're gonna notice that you don't have to go through that whole process of them hopefully getting back to that shot. They'll go straight to that and actually start to build up from that 60 or 70% close to the hero image as opposed to starting from 0% like we did when we shot the first time. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to put the 70 to 300 on the A7R2. Again, keeping the lights exactly the same as the prior setup. What I'm looking to do now is I want to be able to zoom in on the model's face and really capture the expression and capture the detail in her face in a much more different way than you would with the 85 millimeter focal length. The 70 to 300 is a very different lens and one of the things that I really love about it is that it's not the conventional studio lens that you would use when you're shooting portraits. It's very versatile, extremely versatile, because you could shoot at 70 mil and you can actually have a little bit of a wider crop on your portraits. And then you could also start to zoom in and you can go to 135, 200 millimeter, up to 300 millimeters to where you're really tight and really close on the model's face. Now, a lot of the times people are looking for what you call fast glass. They're looking for lenses that allow you to shoot at an f2.8 or under that. And the 70 to 300 is a 4.5 to 5.6 aperture. And so a lot of people say, oh, I wanna have a faster lens. But what they don't realize is that in the studio, you're shooting at f8, f9, f11. And so you don't need fast glass when you're shooting in the studio. This lens, the 70 to 300, is just insanely amazing. And for me as a studio portrait photographer, I feel like it's the lens, like it's the one lens that you get that 85 millimeter focal length like you would with the G Master, but you also get an infinite number of lenses just kind of all packed into one. Extremely sharp, very, very lightweight as well. And so that's part of the reason why I love the 70 to 300 is just its amazing versatility. 
Now we're gonna go ahead and use the 90 millimeter 2.8 macro on the A7R2. We haven't changed any of the lighting settings. We haven't changed anything with the modifier. We've kept everything exactly the same. We just switched the lens. The 90 macro is gonna be something that captures a lot more detail. It's gonna be a lot sharper. I'm still gonna be able to get a lot closer to her face as well. So that's really what we're trying to do is it's kind of a mix between the 70 to 300 where we're gonna shoot something a little bit tighter, but we're gonna have the added benefit of additional detail and additional sharpness, which is gonna give more of a high def look to those portraits. The 90 macro is a very special tool in my arsenal of lenses. And I kind of jokingly call it Excalibur because it is just the sharpest lens in my toolkit. And while I don't use it all of the time, it's basically one of those lenses that if I'm trying to get maximum amounts of sharpness and maximum detail, the 90 millimeter 2.8 macro is going to be my go-to lens. For the shots that I'm shooting today, I'm going to want to get some images that have all of this detail that really show off the work that the hair and makeup artist did on her makeup, on her lipstick, on her nails. These are all things that a lot of people wonder if you add this additional detail in post, but in actuality, I'm capturing all in camera using this 90 millimeter macro. Now we're gonna go ahead and use the Sony A6300 paired with the 50 millimeter 1.8. This combination is really new. It's only been out now for a very, very short period of time, but it's a fantastic combo. First off, the 50 millimeter 1.8 is kind of the go-to lens for somebody that's starting out in photography and you wanna get that one lens that you could just keep it on your camera body and go outdoors and shoot portraits and shoot landscapes and do street photography. There's a lot of versatility there as well. You'll also notice that at the price point, it is insane the optics that they have put into this lens. One of the things that I really love about this combination of the A6300 and the 50 millimeter 1.8 is that you can get amazing quality of images in a combination that probably wouldn't be the first combo that you would think of if you were trying to shoot studio portraits. This may not be the go-to setup for them because they haven't seen it being used properly. So that's why I'm super excited to be able to show you that you could take this A6300 with a 50 millimeter 1.8 and you could take spectacular quality images using a very small, very lightweight combo. It's great for shooting it in the studio. You could take this camera with you everywhere because it's so small and so compact. So that combination for me, I think is something that makes that package very, very appealing to a lot of photographers. We've changed our lighting setup a tiny bit here. I've taken off the big, huge, monster light modifier, and we are now putting on a soft silver umbrella. It's gonna be off to my right side, and part of the reason that I'm doing that is I want to be able to have a little bit of shadow to really define the curvature of her face. I still want the shadows to be soft, though, so that's part of the reason why I don't have a bright silver interior in this umbrella. It's kind of a soft silver interior, and that basically is gonna make the shadows apparent, but they're not gonna be super, super dark. And so with this setup, you're gonna see that they're gonna look very, very similar to the shots that we got with all of the other camera bodies and lenses, but we're doing it almost on a budget here because the camera body is gonna be a little bit more affordable, the lens is a little more affordable, and then of course the lighting modifier, you could probably buy an umbrella for maybe 30 or $40. Beautiful, there we go. Next shot, bring the eyes to me, just the eyes. Do that same one more time, just the eyeballs, there you go. In this video, you learned about how to create a hero shot, setting up your camera, lenses, lights, and studio space, the advantages of tethering your camera, working with your subjects to pose them and get natural looking hand placement. And finally, using a variety of cameras, lenses, and lights to achieve different looks. Today I pulled back the curtain on a professional studio shoot. I also showed you a variety of Sony camera bodies and lens combinations to get me to my hero shot. So I want you to take everything that you've learned today and go out and get your own hero shot.